I think they did the worst thing possible, which is they took the middle path. If you think about what the Fed has the ability to do, they obviously have the ability to raise and lower interest rates. But what we don't talk about is they have a balance sheet that can absorb assets. For the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a phenomenon called quantitative easing. And for folks that have don't understand what that means, that is essentially the Federal Reserve buying assets out of the market and giving people money for it so that, that people can then go and buy other things with that money. Last June, they started what's called quantitative tightening, which is essentially reversing that policy and restricting the liquidity in the system. So if you look at those tools and you sort of play a game tree on what the Fed could have done, I think that you have two choices. One is you massively let inflation run amok where you have no tools to fix, or you have massive illiquidity in the financial system, but you actually do have tools to fix that which is through some combination of quantitative easing and tightening, depending on how much liquidity you want in the system. So I think, actually, I disagree with Sachs. I think they should have done the opposite. They should have raised 50 bips. It would have created a little bit more chaos in the short term, but it would have set us up to understand what was fundamentally broken and still give the Federal Reserve the ability to use their balance sheet and use liquidity in the future to solve the problem. They took the worst option, which is neither did they cut, nor did they raise enough. And so this problem that Sachs represents actually is the fundamental problem now, which is you won't have enough clarity and signal to really know whether this 25 basis point enough. Look, I've maintained now for nine months that rates are gonna be long, higher than we like and longer than we want. And so I think it's high time that we acknowledge that we have a sticky inflation problem whose back we have to break. We've known since Volcker era what we need to do to do that, which is you need to get interest rates to be greater than terminal inflation, which means that a 5% Fed funds rate is insufficient. So we're going to need to see a print of 5.5%, 5 5.75%. And that's when you're going to have enough contraction, and then the Fed can come back with liquidity. But if they don't take these steps, we're going to be in this very choppy, neither here, neither there situation. And I think that is what causes the real damage because it's the corrosive effects of uncertainty and what that does to lending, to risk taking. And that I think is really bad for the economy. Narratives among crypto bulls are ephemeral except for one. Bitcoin, BTC, is an antidote to unconventional Federal Reserve monetary policies. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Chamath Palihapitiya gives us an overview of the Silicon Valley bank collapse and who or what is to blame. And also, what does this mean for the VC industry? You can see it in the credit default spreads of these banks. It's in the water table already, so you can, Nick, you can just throw it up. If you look at any bank that's lending and that has a portfolio, this is Deutsche Bank's, you know, euro denominated CDS. But it's the same for Barclays, it's the same for SockGen, it's the same for a bunch of American banks. There is a risk in the system that Sachs articulated that is now getting priced in. There are all kinds of loans whose payments, which the banks need, cannot necessarily be insured, which means that then there could be illiquidity there. There could be a flow of deposits out from those banks, which would then make their ability to pay their debt holders lower. You also have this complicated issue already where it's really like the first time in a long, long, long time where debt holders actually got wiped out in the Credit Suisse debacle before the equity holders did. And that's created all kinds of ripple effects. So this credit bubble is here and it's being manifested right now in these very sophisticated parts of the market. And eventually they'll ripple to the broader economy at large. But how a person feels this is they're not gonna be able to get a car loan or a mortgage or the interest rates they pay will go up. And then how 
bondholders will react to all of this stuff is they'll just start to find different assets, probably the front end of the curve, money market, cash, gold, and they'll just abandon all these assets. And then the other problem is that it's just really, really bad for risk assets. So the things that we invest in- Startups, technology companies. Yeah. Either in a world of inflation run amok because the Fed isn't hiking fast enough, which just destroys future cash flows, or in a world where the Fed pivots in a moment like this, and Nick, you can show the second chart, both result in the same outcome, which is that you just see these massive drawdowns in the value of risk assets. So we're in a really complicated moment. And this is why I think, again, the Fed needed to take leadership this past week and actually do the hard work of either cutting 50 bips or raising 50 bips. And this middle path is the absolute worst path because trying to thread a needle in this complicated economy, I think, is just going to be impossible. And then what happens is then the markets move around them, right? The markets have completely said, we now discredit what you did. And they're basically banking that the Fed will be forced to cut rates massively in short course because the crisis will be so severe that it'll outweigh the risk of inflation. It has recently reached a fever pitch on crypto Twitter, thanks to venture capitalist and angel investor Balaji Srinivasan saying he'd wager that Bitcoin will hit the $1 million mark within 90 days. The former Coinbase chief technology officer also predicted a U.S. banking crisis that would crash the dollar and spur hyperinflation, an excessively fast rise in the price of goods and services. The U.S. dollar, the de facto global reserve currency, has yet to suffer through this type of extreme devaluation. I, I think it's not the end of days, but I, I think you're conflating a bunch of things together. So look, MMT yes, I am. Yes. was in hindsight idiotic. In the moment, it never quite made sense, but in hindsight, it's clearly idiotic. And I think that we can properly dispense with that. But the reason that we print so much money is sort of what Freebrook says, which is that we just want a well-functioning society. And the simplest and shortest way to do that is to make sure that there aren't any winners and losers anymore. And the most effective way to do that in the markets is with money. Print a bunch of money and there are no more winners and losers. And so everybody can kind of win. Some people may, may win more, but nobody really ever loses. So I think that's the, that's the MO that we're operating under. The thing is, There's I don't think that- There's something unhealthy to that, Chamath. You're sort of alluding yeah, to but no losers. That's a more philosophical and a commentary on capitalism and a bunch of other things. And you're right. I don't think it makes sense. I do think you need winners and losers to really make society function well. But the other part of it is like, does it reinforce or does it decay US dollar hegemony? And I think it actually reinforces it. And the reason is just very practically speaking, when you look at how dependent other people, other countries are on the US dollar, in times of stress, they actually become more dependent. And that has a lot to do with their borrowing patterns, the amount of dollars central banks need outside the United States. And so what did you see in a moment of stress? Actually, the Fed opened up swap lines to all the central banks that they work with, eh, their most important operating partners, so Europe, Canada, Japan, et cetera, Switzerland. And they moved the liquidity window from weekly to daily, and they pounded the swap lines. So I don't know. I think that most people that that kind of like, it's like a boy crying wolf. Maybe at some point somebody will be right, but you're going to lose so much money trying to take a point of view around this topic that it's more practical to just look at dollar flows. And dollar flows go up in moments of stress, not go down. And they go up in a distributed manner across the monetary plumbing of the world. Balaji's prediction follows the Fed opening liquidity taps in the form of dollar lending programs to contain the banking sector instability in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. Similar forecasts predicting Weimar Republic-style U.S. hyperinflation made plenty of noise following the COVID-spurred crash of March 2020 and the 2008 global meltdown. On both occasions, the Fed poured trillions of dollars into the system through outright asset purchases or quantitative easing. 
QE. Hyperinflation almost always results from a large amount of money chasing the same amount of goods and services being supplied in an economy. In other words, the money created through QE or other measures must be spent on the stagnant stock of goods and services to boost inflation. Assets like stocks or cryptocurrencies can hyperinflate in terms of valuations if the newly created money enters financial markets instead of the real economy, as it did following the 2008 and 2020 crashes. Yeah, it's the latter. I mean, I think that there was a rumor going around. I don't know how true it is that FTX was days away from getting a critical approval by the SEC to actually even further legitimize their U.S. exchange before they went out of business. So I think Gensler had to pivot very hard from at a minimum being very pro FTX. And there's all kinds of stories about his interrelatedness with Sam and his family to very anti-bit or anti-crypto in general. That's clearly happened. But look, I think that this is like a lot of tin hatting, which I don't think is very productive. If mm -hmm. you look at the total number of non-zero Bitcoin wallet addresses in the world, and let's be extremely generous and say it's 100 million, there are still 7 billion people in the world. And so I just think everybody that tries to speak about the fragility of the US and worldwide banking system is right. But, and that part I think is quite lucid and unemotional. But every time they try to connect it to Bitcoin, they sound like a crazy person because they're yeah. just talking their book. And that is exactly the case, by the way, with this kid, Nick Carter. Yeah. And the best example to demonstrate this is in all of this chaos, if Bitcoin or crypto assets in general were truly a legitimate off-ramp and salvation from US dollar hegemony and all of this stuff, why isn't Bitcoin at least at 35,000 a coin right now? It's barely above 28,000. It really hasn't moved that much. And I think the real answer is that most people in Bitcoin are not trying to hedge their existing fiat currency exposure. They're just picking off people in retail. <laughs> and they're just yeah. day trading this thing. I well, mean, the, I think that's you explain, how else do you explain an asset that is not absolutely ripped in the face of all of this terrible news about the financial system? And I think the answer is because it's still a cul-de-sac of users. It's not broadly available, not broadly adoptable, not broadly used. I, I still believe that it's valuable. I was the earliest proponent of Bitcoin, 2011, yeah, right. yeah. 2012. So I believe that there's a place for it in, in one's portfolio, but I just think connecting these dots misses the point. And I think the point is much, much bigger than a crypto off-ramp. The point is that we have a lot of systemic shocks that are building up in the system. We have broken a ton of the systems that caused the financial infrastructure and the world to work properly. And we are just starting to uncover how they're broken. So I think we need to focus our energy on that and dial down a little bit of the Bitcoin maxi stuff because it distracts from a really important set of topics that are more inclusive and actually touch 7 billion people. So what are your thoughts about the Silicon Valley Bank collapse? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.